And uh, I've always considered Leo to be uh, a real giant in cardiac surgery and one of my dearest friends. And it's a real pleasure and privilege for me to be here again. I'll talk about the interventional treatment of atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> Many years ago, back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, we did a lot of electrophysiologic mapping with up to 250 electrodes in experimental animals and also in human beings where we placed the plaque electrodes around the various places in the atrium. <clears throat> and what we were looking for is uh, a common denominator for uh, something that caused this electrocardiogram. Atrial fibrillation is a clinical diagnosis. And a lot of different things can make electrocardiograms look this way. So we were trying to find a common denominator. And what we found was that any time an EKG looks like this, there are at least two or more simultaneous large reentrant circuits present in the atrium. Now these can be anywhere. They can both be in the left. They can both be in the right. There can be more than two. They can be different sizes. And they can occur anywhere in the atrium. But as long as there are two or more of these present, it will give you a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. So knowing that, we thought <clears throat> perhaps we could put lesions uh, in the heart and uh, put them close enough together that these large reentrant circuits could not form. Uh, one of the ways to do this, of course, is just to bread loaf the heart, but then one wouldn't have anything left. So uh, at that time, uh, the only thing that was available for the treatment of atrial fibrillation was catheter fulguration of the Hiss bundle. And um, this was in 1987. Uh, we did the so-called maze procedure. Now, the idea was that we had mapped, or, so, or at least there had been reported, all of these different reentrant circuits in the atrium. And the idea was to place these incisions around over the atrium so that these reentrant circuits could not form. So the first goal was to ablate all of the potential macro reentrant circuits. And that could be done quite easily. The second goal, however, was the resumption of normal sinus rhythm. This is why you did not bread loaf the atrium. So by putting them in certain places, um, it allowed the sinus node to generate an impulse that had one true route into the AV node and ventricles and it also activated all of the rest of the atrium as well to allow it to, to um, beat. So you had one entrance and one exit, you had one true route between the two, and you had multiple blind alleys, so that's why we called it the maze procedure. Now, we went through several iterations of the maze procedure over the next several years. This was 1987. And uh, by 1995 or 1996, we developed it into a minimally invasive cryosurgical procedure. But the next really important thing that came along was Michel Hasseguer in Bordeaux published his uh, findings that atrial fibrillation is induced by triggers in and around the pulmonary veins, and so pulmonary vein isolation was a reasonable thing to do. So we knew what patients looked like in normal sinus rhythm. We knew what they looked like in atrial fibrillation, but this was a gap. We did not know what induced the atrial fibrillation, and that awaited uh, over a decade before Hasseguer showed us that uh, these episodes are actually induced by triggers in and around the pulmonary veins in 90% of patients and elsewhere outside the pulmonary veins in 10%. Now, he originally thought that all these triggers were located actually inside the pulmonary vein orifices, but they were not. As we learned later, uh, they can come from anywhere around here. But if you encompass this entire area, you theoretically should get 90% of them. We've also learned since then that these are all in standalone atrial fibrillation patients. And in patients surgeons see, for example, with mitral valve disease, rather than 90, 10, this may be more like 70, 30. But be that as it may, uh, what John Boino, my mentor, Rick Schuster, and I showed back in the 80s then, was actually how atrial fibrillation is sustained once it's been induced. What Hasseguer and PRJ showed it, uh, a few years later was how atrial fibrillation is induced. And this, allowed, this fit like hand and glove and allowed us to understand then the difference in how patients and why patients present to us clinically. 
For example, a patient in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is in normal sinus rhythm most of the time and then has a trigger usually around the pulmonary veins that induces an episode of atrial fibrillation and that episode is usually self-limiting so that after a few hours uh, the, the patient will resume normal sinus rhythm. So this is the cycle of what's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and obviously the culprit is the PAC here. Now you have to have an atrium that's vulnerable to the development of atrial fibrillation because we all have a lot of PACs that do not induce atrial fibrillation. But the uh, fact of the matter is that if you are vulnerable and you can sustain these reentrant circuits for a while, then these PACs or these triggers can induce an episode. A further problem comes when these reentrant circuits became, become self-perpetuating. And in that situation, these episodes are no longer, no longer self-limiting, and they don't convert back to sinus rhythm, but they become prolonged, persistent, or even permanent. In that situation, you have what could be lumped into one big category of non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and these, uh, this, these triggers have little or nothing to do uh, with the atrial fibrillation once this is sustained. So if you're going to treat it, uh, you have to do something about these reentrant circuits. So from an interventional standpoint, that is catheter ablation or surgery, there are really only two categories of atrial fibrillation. One category is caused by triggers, usually in and around the pulmonary veins. It's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And uh, the atrial fibrillation is either paroxysmal or it's not. And if it's not, uh, non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation includes persistent, long-standing, persistent, and even permanent. This is from an interventional standpoint because these people are going to be treated with a pulmonary vein isolation, and these are going to have to be treated with a maze procedure or something more drastic than a pulmonary vein isolation. So we're back now to the minimally invasive maze procedure and the pulmonary vein isolation in 1998, and something very strange happened at that point. Uh, there were a lot of new energy sources developed to isolate these pulmonary veins, and there were a lot of people who got involved, surgeons and cardiologists, to create a lot of new lesion patterns, believing that we could no, long, no longer had to do a, a complex maze. These are the energy sources prior to 1998. These are the ones after 1998. And you can see that all, some of these are no longer on the market, but there, were, there was a lot of development, particularly in industry and trying to develop new energy sources. In addition, there were new lesion patterns. Uh, there were some incomplete or bizarre lesion patterns like this one. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, so a lot of these lesion patterns had not been, uh, were not applied appropriately. In addition, the right atrium was completely ignored in virtually all of these, which means you're gonna fail a significant amount of the time. And in addition, there was no coronary sinus lesion in any of these patients, which adds another 10 or 15 percent failure rate. So the results were not as good as, as we had hoped, and, 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 and the problem was that we're now 15 years down the road and, and we have what I call bad algebra. If somebody gives you this formula and asks you to solve for x, there's no way to do it because you need only one variable and there were too many variables here. So we're facing the same situation if X is lesion patterns and Y is energy sources and we have this huge failure rate, is it because of the lesion patterns or is it because of the energy sources? Most people over the years have, uh, have blamed it on the energy sources. Uh, that uh, RF is no good or that cryo is no good or the microwave is no good. But the fact of the matter is that most of these energy sources have been applied uh, with lesion patterns that were applied incorrectly. So, um, the, 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 the other development that has impacted our specialty since that time is the so-called maze four, which Ralph Damiano uh, described about 2002. And I will clarify for you that the maze three and the maze four both isolate the pulmonary veins and everything else is exactly the same. So there's no electrophysiologic difference in these two. We now refer to it often as the maze three slash four. Um, when a patient comes to you with atrial fibrillation, they can have either standalone, that is, not as unassociated with uh, heart disease serious enough to require surgery, 
Uh, that makes up about 97% of all AF in the United States, and I'm assuming in Russia as well, and it's treated, if it is treated at all with intervention, is treated with catheters. Uh, st uh, concomitant AFib is that associated with usually mitral valve disease, but also coronary and aortic valve disease. It makes up the other third, uh, three percent. And again, if it's treated at all, it's treated with surgery at the time of the primary operation. So let's look at the situation with concomitant atrial fibrillation treatment. Uh, if a patient has a coronary artery bypass, uh, is coming for coronary artery bypass grafting and has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, that means that this is the problem, the triggers. And the surgical options are simple pulmonary vein isolation. Now because this is a concomitant case, if you isolate the pulmonary veins perfectly, you'll get about a 70% success rate. Um, the other option, of course, is to do a maze procedure, but you wouldn't normally open the left atrium in a patient with, for cabbage. So that uh, is something one has to decide on. Most really experienced uh, arrhythmia surgeons would not hesitate to do a maze procedure. Most uh, who are just getting into the business would most likely do a pulmonary vein isolation. The worst thing you can do in this case is leave it alone. If the patient has non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the pulmonary vein isolation is really of no value and can in fact create problems, create more problems than it solves. So you're either left with a situation of ignoring it or uh, the only surgical option is a maze procedure and the surgeon has to make that decision at the time of surgery. It's exactly the same for aortic valve patients in whom you would not normally open the left atrium. Uh, the options here are pulmonary vein isolation or a maze and with non-PAF, the options uh, are the same just with a maze procedure. However, with mitral valve surgery, assuming you're opening the left atrium to do the mitral valve repair, regardless of whether the patient has paroxysmal or uh, uh, persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, those patients should undergo a, a maze. And in experienced hands, this adds about 15 minutes to the procedure, so it's not a big deal. If you look at the treatment of concomitant AF in the United States in 2009, there were about 103,000 patients who entered our operating rooms for either coronary bypass, mitral valve surgery, or aortic valve surgery. About 100, sorry, there were about 400,000 of those, but 103,000 of them also had atrial fibrillation. And only 20% of them were actually treated. So one out of every five, uh, four out of every five patients were ignored. Um, when you looked into the reasons, it was because most surgeons felt that you added risk to the surgery. So Nevide uh, did this uh, uh, paper a year later and asked about uh, uh, do we really increase the operative risk by adding the maze and said no. In patients with aortic valve surgery and cabbage, the addition, opening the left atrium and adding the maze 3 did not convey an increase in morbidity to a perioperative risk. Ralph Damiano subsequently looked at it in patients with mitral valve surgery and found the same thing. So adding the procedure in experienced hands does not add any uh, risk to the operation. The benefits of the operation, there are many. I've pulled out a few of the most important. There's a significant difference in the uh, incidence of long-term stroke uh, following surgery and treated and untreated patients. There's a significant difference in uh, thromboembolism from the valve itself, uh, as well as from atrial fibrillation. Uh, there's a decrease actually in all cardiac complications in the treated patients as opposed to the untreated ones. And there's an improvement in long-term survival. Now these are not prospective randomized trials, uh, but they are done in, in excellent places by excellent people like Rick Lee from, the, from Northwestern. So, now, as a result of some of these publications in 2013, we're up to about 40% of these patients being treated as opposed to 60%. What about standalone atrial fibrillation? Well, that's now in the, uh, relegated to catheter ablation in terms of interventional treatment, <clears throat> though there are some, patients, some uh, centers in the states where standalone surgery is done for atrial fib, but not many. If you look at the distribution, uh, the current status of, uh, uh, of the number of catheter ablations that are done, only about 2% of the people who have atrial fibrillation actually undergo catheter ablation. 3%, uh, as I said, have, uh, have atrial fibrillation associated with surgical conditions. 
and the other 95% are treated with drugs. Um, that represents about 3 million people in the U.S. So over the last couple of years, there have been three major publications on the success rates of catheter ablation for AF. One was done by the Hopkins Group, headed by Hugh Hawkins. One was done by Hasegar himself, published in two, three years ago. And the other by Carl Heinz Cook, who is uh, uh, one of the most outstanding uh, surgeons uh, or catheter bladers in the world in, in Hamburg. Uh, if you look at the results that they report in these series, the reason I pulled these three out is because they have a long-term follow-up. Most of the papers on catheter ablation report the one-year results. And I've said before, that's very much like reporting the one-year results for pancreatic cancer. Uh, a Whipple procedure is extremely effective for can pancreatic cancer if you look at the one-year results. At five years, they're all dead. So uh, I think we're in a, pro in a situation now where we really should not be publishing papers that have one-year follow-ups. If you look at Hugh Calkins' paper, he went to two years, actually 26 months. And a single catheter ablation success rate at two years was 28%. With multiple catheter ablations, it was up about 65% at two years. If you look at Hasek here, he did, uh, he evaluated his results at one year, two years, and five years for single catheter ablation, and he reported a result of 29%. Uh, his multiple catheter ablation results were, of course, better, but still about 65%, 63% at five years. Carl, uh, uh, Carl Heinz Cook looked just at long-standing persistent AF, and at five years, the success rate was 20%. Uh, for multiple catheter ablations, it was 45%. So if you look at the five-year results that are reported by the leaders in their uh, literature, I think it's safe to say that the five-year results for single catheter ablation are about 25%, and the five-year results for multiple catheter ablations is about 50%. Now, in Hasegar's group, 63% of those people had paroxysmal AFib. And in Calkin's group, 50% had paroxysmal AFib. And Carl Heinz Cook's group, all of the patients had long-standing persistent. So we're beginning to get a handle now on what uh, the real results are. Are the right atrial lesions necessary? I put this in because I'm constantly asked this question, and we constantly see papers coming out saying they're not necessary. Well. This was a, uh, a uh, meta-analysis done by Nevide uh, uh, a few years ago. S at that time, 69 papers had been reported, 5,885 total patients, and the bilateral surgical procedures were more effective. Uh, these are the results with, when both, both sides uh, were approached. These are the results when the right atrial lesions were left out. If you look at the other reports, either surgery in red, single catheter ablation in blue, multiple catheter ablation in green, the results uh, are all these, even if you do surgery and you can find it to the left atrium with no right atrial lesions are in this range. If you look at the ones, uh, surgery and hybrid procedures, both RA and LA lesions obviously give you better results. So the question then is, what's going to happen to these group of patients here? That there are really two options. The catheter bladers can either pace a blade and now occlude the left atrial appendage, or they can join with the surgeons to do hybrid procedures, which has really become popular recently. The HRS defines um, hybrid procedures as a joint AF ablation uh, performed by EPs and surgeons either as a joint procedure or as two pre-planned separate procedures separated by no more than six months. So it gives three options. One is surgery and catheter as a joint setting. One is initial catheter ablation followed by surgery, which is essentially what all surgery is now anyhow. And the other intriguing possibility is initial surgery followed by catheter ablation. Now, we've never really considered initial surgery as a, as a, as a feasible approach to um, uh, patients. But let's, if we compared surgery versus catheter as a hybrid procedure in one arm and catheter versus catheter in another, we know what catheter versus catheter shows. If we do a catheter ablation early, uh, we know what happens. So if we do a catheter ablation early as a first step 
and then do another one sometime within the first year, we know we're going to get about 85 or 90% success at one year. But we also know that by five years, it's going to be down to around 50% or 55%. If we do surgery first, we'll get about an 80%, 70 or 80% initial success rate, followed by a catheter ablation to touch up and add a couple of lines. And we know that uh, at least in one experience in Italy, 92% success at three years, which projects to about a 90% success when surgery is done as the initial procedure at five years. Now, the reason we haven't been able to do this uh, before is because of the limitations of previously minimally invasive surgery. Because we've done all these different types of minimally invasive procedures, but they all require a lot of different uh, interventions, such as uh, dual lumen intubation, cardiopulmonary bypass, and systemic heparinization. Nevertheless, we've called them minimally invasive, but it raises the question that was used to be asked of one of our old uh, uh, comedians in the United States, Henny Youngman, and he was asked the question, how's your wife? And he said, "In compare, compared to what? And that's sort of the way we are with minimally invasive surgery. If this is minimally invasive surgery, it's minimally invasive compared to what? Well, it's minimally invasive compared to a median sternotomy. But uh, these are the kinds of minimally invasive procedures uh, that surgeons are doing now, where uh, virtually the entire procedure is done as an initial part of a hybrid procedure, and then the catheter later comes along six weeks or three months later uh, to do his thing. So the rationale for a staged hybrid surgery catheter procedure is a complete maze cannot, cannot be done off pump by thoracoscopic surgery by anybody, anywhere off pump. A complete maze, well, sorry, I made this on a Mac and uh, it's on a PC, but a complete maze procedure cannot be performed by catheter ablation alone. Interventional EPs are excellent at localizing and closing the gaps of failed surgical lesions, and interventional EPs are excellent at creating conduction block in narrow, confined areas of the atrium. So as the initial procedure, uh, these are the documented left atrial macro reentrant circuits and non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And if you do a maze three or a maze four, you get rid of most of them, pass the lesion out to the base of the appendage and put a clip on the appendage. Uh, and what I recommend is putting radiopaque vascular clips uh, here so that if you do get a problem later, the cardiologist will know where to go. On the right side, these are the documented right atrial uh, macro reentrant circuits. Uh, there's one that goes around the tricuspid valve, one that goes around anterior to the SVC and one that goes around posterior to the SVC. They all use the CAVO tricuspid isthmus. So if we look at that in 3D, uh, this one would go posterior, use the CAVO tricuspid isthmus. This one would go anterior to the SVC, still uses the isthmus. And this one would go around the mitral annulus, or the tricuspid annulus, and also uses the CAVO tricuspid isthmus. So you'd think that all you need to do is put the flutter lesion between, uh, across the cavo tricuspid isthmus, but there are some other reentrant circuits that have been identified by Hasegar and others around the SVC, around the IVC, and around the base of the atrial appendage. So what we recommend uh, as a part of the original surgical procedure is to uh, put a linear lesion between the SVC and the IVC, which eliminates these put a lesion out to the atrial appendage. Both of these lesions can be performed quite easily um, through a thoracoscope in the right chest. And you do leave the possibility of this one, but the cardiologist can get that one later. So this would be the completed initial procedure, the left and right, all of which can be done uh, pretty easily with a thoracoscope, but this is not a complete maze procedure. Follow-up catheter ablation, what you're likely to see in about 20% of people are, is what's called uh, perimitral flutter. Uh, since you have these vascular clips in, the cardiologist uh, is uh, quite good if you show him exactly where to go to eliminate that, pass the catheter in the coronary sinus and eliminate that limb. And uh, if on the right side the patient has had uh, uh, an episode of atrial flutter, then a simple flutter lesion there will stop it. And then also the cardiologist can touch up any of these lesions that may have failed over a six or 12 week period of time. So the final hybrid procedure would in fact be a maze procedure. This would be the initial surgical procedure. Several weeks later, 
uh, the completion uh, with, the, with the catheter and touch up of any of the lesions here. And this, in fact, is a complete maze procedure. So the objective is to, is to create a complete maze procedure off pump with a combination of initial surgery followed by catheter ablation. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, makes this attractive is that we hopefully will, will eliminate the uh, problems that we faced back here when we, when we first started trying to do less of a procedure. So I think that the reason this is the direction we're going in surgery is that it will continue to be extremely difficult to do this with catheter ablation alone. It will continue to take EPs a long time to do it if they do it at all. With the hybrid procedure, it's very important that the cardiologist will still be the gatekeeper for the patients. We should not be competing with cardiologists for these patients. And finally, it should be very quick and easy to perform, and several can be done in a day. And there's no reason that the outcomes should not be equal to those for AF surgery. Again, I very much appreciate your, the opportunity to speak here, and I'll entertain any questions. Thank you. I have, um, I guess, a very critical question. I mean, uh, critical for the for the situation in this area. Uh, Hisaguer said that um, initially he considered what he saw is uh, uh, is an ectopic uh, arrhythmia. How do you consider? Is it ectopic? What what what's called paroxysmal, or is something else? Something different? Well, I've, <clears throat> I've spoken with Michelle Hassegger on several occasions, the most recent being uh, about 10 days ago. I've uh, been to Bordeaux, and then we've uh, taken a, a weekend together, actually, to talk about this over the last couple of years. So we've talked about this a lot. Uh, one of the things that's a real confusion that's been introduced into the literature recently is the concept of rotors. Um, and, you know, all the mapping we've ever done, all the mapping Sonny Jackman has done, all the mapping Andre Natale has done, nobody's ever seen any rotors. Because we primarily do activation time mapping. And the type mapping that's being done in a lot of these centers now is not true activation time mapping. You remember when we used to do that together years ago. Uh, but it's a, a first derivative, which is a voltage map, and then a second derivative, which is called a phase mapping, which I have no idea what that means. Uh, and I also don't, know, I don't have any idea how to interpret it. So my simple question has been to Michelle uh, Hasegger is I'll accept whatever you want to teach me if I think it's correct. But if I put a lesion here and I put a lesion here, tell me how that stops a reentrant circuit that's being sustained by something this big in between. If you can explain that to me, I'll buy it. But the fact is that if atrial fibrillation were sustained by focal mechanisms as their primary way of sustaining. The maze procedure would never work. There's no way it would work. So I, I simply have no other explanation. I have no explanation for what they're seeing. Yeah, I think uh, that's very important, your explanation, because there are many electrophysiologists inside this room, and, you know, they should be very clear. And, for example, I'm very much satisfied by this lecture and arguments you gave. You know, it's... Uh, we have, we have to publish it in uh, Russian journals. If you well, at the mind. HRS meeting in San Francisco last week, I <clears throat> specifically, I've always been very close to Sonny Jackman, as I know you have, and I asked Sonny, um, I, I said, Sonny, I want you to explain this to me. And I also I talked with Michelle, he was also there. Um, but there's no language barrier between Sonny and me, and we've known each other for many years. And I said, you need to explain this to me because I simply do not understand it. And his answer was, I don't have a clue what they're talking about. So I said, well, if you don't understand it, that makes me feel a lot better because I don't understand it either. Uh, when he was standing here in this auditorium, I'm mean, Hisaguer, I, uh, I asked almost the same question, and he said that you in the operating room see and can do much more, and that's why maybe your answer is more correct. <laughs> maybe. Marco? Just for the sake of audience, um, 
I must tell you that Dr. Cox uh, referred to his talk all the time about the maze procedure for the rest of the world, and for all of us it's called Cox maze procedure. <laughs> so, to just give a proper... Well, I've never referred to it that way because I don't think my mom would have liked that. <laughs> just that. <laughs> you can't do anything because he, he said a couple times that, you know, people think that maze is a name. And that's why he started adding his name, his real name. No, 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 I never <laughs> added my name to it. <laughs> but a question here, uh, Jim. <clears throat> May, we had, of course, some experience with this, and we had the impression that the sign of the rhythm, after properly performed Cox Maze 3, is somewhat deficient in terms of a certain chronotropic incompetence. Meaning, if you let the patient run the stairs, he will not increase his heart rate as a normal sign of rhythm. What's your experience? Yeah, that, we had that experience with the maze one because we were putting lesions through the what we call the sinus tachycardia area, which is where the SVC comes into the right atrium just anteriorly there. And that's why we went to the maze two, as, as a matter of fact. Um, there, there have been a lot of. There's always been a lot of concern about this procedure causing injury to the sinus node. And uh, I, I think it's, it's a bit misleading. There, there are basically three or four groups of patients. There are a group of patients who come to the operating room who already have pacemakers. So those should be excluded. That may be 10%. There's another group of patients who have long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, and you can't determine what the status of their sinus node is. And we know that about 20% of those people have a deficient sinus node. When we get rid of the atrial fib, then you find they have a sick sinus node syndrome. Um, that's 20% of all patients who, that, who you can't check beforehand. There's another group of patients in our series who we were able to check before surgery and found that they did have a sick sinus node. So we tell them you're gonna have to have a pacemaker afterwards. And then there's a fourth group who we were able to check their sinus node pre-op, and they were normal, perfectly normal. We had 115 patients. One of those patients required a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. So I think that the idea that if a properly performed that a properly performed procedure causes the problem is not really true. I think that what really happens is you unmask. Um, a sinus node that's deficient. And remember that virtually all antiarrhythmic drugs can cause damage, permanent damage, to the sinus node. So it's, uh, it's a very complex problem. Uh, probably sometimes you do damage it, but I think it's very rare. Ludwig? Ludwig Segers, Lausanne, Switzerland. Dr. Cox, uh, you showed us very nicely how to uh, get back to a sinus rhythm or something similar. Can you tell us something about transport function, shortening fraction of the atrium? Yes, yes. The, uh, probably the thing we studied most when we were developing this uh, procedure was transport function because uh, obviously if you do all these lesions, um, regardless of how you do them, and the atrium is not working afterwards, then you may as well put a you know, may as well ablate the his bone and put a pacemaker in. So we looked at it from a lot of different standpoints, as have others over the years with dynamic MRI scans and so on and so forth. And the best way to look at it is transesophageal echocardiography. Um, what we found is that uh, well over 90% of the patients still have good function of the left atrium. Virtually everyone still has good function of the right atrium. And um, Amaran will remember quite well a left atrial isolation procedure that we did years ago where we isolated the left atrium from the rest of the heart. I think he wrote his thesis on it. But nevertheless, um, that gave us an opportunity to look at the function of the right atrium compared to the left atrium, or, or end of it, separate from the left atrium. So we reproduced sinus rhythm by putting an AV sequential pacemaker between the right atrium and the left and so on. And what we found is that as long as the right atrium and right ventricle are in synchrony, in the presence of a normal left ventricle, it doesn't matter what's going on in the left atrium. The, whether it's contracting, beating in synchrony, fibrillating, whatever. However, 
the 20% increase, so I think the contractile function, even a normal atrium, is quite overrated. What's not overrated is the synchrony of it. I equate it uh, to swinging a child in a swing, and if you stop that child each time and push again and stop him and push again, then you have to exert a lot of energy. But once that child's swinging, all you have to do is give a little tap at exactly the right time to keep that child swinging forever. The, I think that the atrial contraction is probably more like an atrial tap. That's exactly, it's, it's, it should be exactly the right time. The blood's going through the left side of the heart, whether the atrium contracts or not, we know that. So I think on the one hand, yes, the atrial function is probably decreased some by all these incisions. I think it's, uh, it certainly still does have some contractile function, uh, but I think the most important thing is the synchrony of that contractile function because I think it's more a tap, the atria more capacitance chambers than contracting chambers.